Hello, my brothers and sisters. This is series 391. And the lesson today is number nine. This is the ninth part of the Lord's Prayer. God deliver us from evil. Matthew 6 and 13. And the instruction says, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to, do, how to reverence, honor, and respect what is deeply felt and outwardly, outward, outwardly distrim, hmm, demonstration of God's awesome loving power and his sound mind. This is what this is demonstrating to the disciples. This is what Jesus is teaching his disciples. How powerful God is and how sound, what a sound mind God has. Then it says, the request of God would deliver us from evil. Comes from the, comes from the Lord's Prayer. This request also contains some difficulties. The word translated, uh, uh, temptation, can also be translated hard testing. Meaning we're going to have some trials and tribulations that's going to be hard testing. The same way Job was. God allowed Satan to test Job. Just like God allowed Satan to test us. And because the only reason he tests us is because he know what we can do. He know that we will refuse to give up on give up on God, the Father. And then it says, and doesn't necessarily refer to a temptation to sin. Job never sinned. It was a temptation that the devil had to throw out there to get you to sin. You see, it's not that he sinned. So we, just because we, we have trials and tribulations, sicknesses, that don't mean we sin now. It means that the devil is trying to get us to sin. To get us to give up on God. This is what we got to understand. We got to realize. Jesus taught his. Uh, his followers to pray. Deliver us from evil. Because we cannot. Listen at this now. We cannot resist the devil. In our own strength. Can't do it. The believer in Christ. Has been delivered from the penalty of sin. That's all. But we are still in a daily battle against sin and the devil. What did Jesus tell Peter? He said, upon this rock I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He didn't say Satan was going to stop trying to tempt him into doing what's wrong. He didn't ever say that. But he said, the gates of hell I shall build upon this rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's good enough for me. He also told Paul that my grace is sufficient. Boy, I got to do a study on that. Oh my God. That's awesome. My grace is sufficient. My love for you is sufficient. That's all you need is my love. Know that I care about you. Know that you are in my heart and mind all the time. That is sufficient. You don't have nothing to worry about. Just like Job was to God. Huh. That was his faithful servant. His faithful servant. He did no wrong. He lived for God. And that's what God is trying to tell us. Live for him and believe. Then it says, the, believe, the believer in Christ has been delivered from the penalty of sin. But we have still, we are still in a battle, in, in a daily battle against sin. And the devil. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit to help 
us resist temptation and overcome sin in our lives. Praying, deliver us from evil, is recognizing our own limited abilities and a means of asking for God to step in and help us. That's what that prayer means. Understand what the prayer really means. We can't do it, but God can. Ask for help. I do it all the time. And the first uh, uh, scripture is Exodus 20, 1 through 6. And it says, Ten Commandments for the Covenant of communi Community. Number one says, Then God gave the people all the instructions these instructions. Number two says, I'm the Lord your God who rescues you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. God was trying to teach them, you got to learn how to reverence me now. Because of what I did for you, learn how to reverence me, learn how to love me, respect me, honor me. Learn how to do that. And he will deliver us from evil. Number three says, you must not have any other gods but me. He's telling them right then, no other gods but me. You don't need nobody else. Number four says, you must not make yourself an idol of any kind or of image of anything in the heavens or the earth. Or in the sea. He said, this is what you must not do. I'm going to deliver you from Egypt, but this is stuff, the stuff that you were doing in Egypt. You can't do this anymore. When you don't reverence God's relationship, it's broken. We don't want to have a broken relationship with God. We want to have a full-fledged relationship in love with God. That's all we know is God and nothing else. Number five says, you must not bow down to them or worship them. These idols, don't bow down to your idol. People, places, and things, don't do that. For I, the Lord your God, am no, am, no, am a jealous God. He's letting you know right now. In this relationship, I'm jealous. You belong to me. And I'm jealous if you go out and mess up on me. This is why husbands and wives get so upset because the husband or the, because the one of the spouses that went out and messed up. They have a right to be upset because God is upset. They don't have the right to beat the, the person up or do something crazy to them. But they have the right to be upset. They have the right to be jealous. Because God is jealous. And we are the image of God. It doesn't, hate, it doesn't give you the right to hate them. Or dislove them. Because God loves us unconditionally. We have to love them no matter what. Unconditionally. Because he loved us the same way. When we was in our filthy rags of sin. Who will not tolerate your affection for any other God. He will not, uh, not even uh, tolerate the affection that you have for any other God. Houses, cars, job, anything that will take your heart away from him. Children, family members, he will not tolerate that. That is a God to him and is a God to us as well. Uh, and then if, to, to, to finish this out, it says, I Lay the sins of the, the, the parents 
upon their children. The entire family is affected. Because if a family child, a child see the mother do something or father do something, they going to mimic what you do. Then when they grow up, they're going to start doing the same thing you do. There's an effect. There's a domino effect. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject him. There's a domino effect behind this sinning and these idols that you worship and just not love God wholeheartedly. And then number six says, but I lavish unfailing love. Look at what he's saying. He's saying, I love unfailing love. He loves it. He loves when you don't fail loving him. For a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my command. For those who love him by obeying his command, by not going out loving another idol. Better than you know, better than you do God. He said, I lavish that kind of unfailing love. I mean, how much better can you have it? Or how better can it get for God to love you no matter what? Think about it. Think about it. How deep God's love really is. Now let's go down to the next one. And we're going to go to back. We're going to go back to Job again. Job 42, 3 through 11, 17. Yeah, 3 through 11, then 16 through 17. And it says, The Lord delivers and blesses Job. Deliver us from evil. Keep that in mind as we go through this lesson. You also, number three, you also, who is this that questions my wisdom, which such ignorance? He said, you question my wisdom with such ignorance? It is, it is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about. This is Joe responding. Think uh, think far too wonderful for me. Things that so far wonderful to me. But I was just thinking and talking. But that's what happens when you use words that you shouldn't use. Because now you're out of place. Number seven says, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to uh, Eliphaz, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about me. He said, y'all don't even know me. That's pretty much what he's saying. Y'all don't know me. To talk about me to Job and you're not saying the right things. You're accusing this man of something that he didn't even do. As my servant Job has, Job spoke accurate, accurately about me, but you didn't. And this is how Job is reverencing God. Through his trials and tribulations, he still didn't say anything wrong about God. He might have spoke out of terms, but he never spoke against God. And this is why, because Job reverenced God. He, his will, he will deliver him from the evil one. Number 10 says, when Job prayed for his friend, the Lord, the Lord restored his 
future. This is what love is all about, y'all. When you love somebody, you're still supposed to pray for them. You're still supposed to love them unconditionally. I don't care what they did to you. It doesn't matter. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. That's why a lot of us is not blessed because we're holding something against people that have done something wrong to us. And God is totally against that. Job couldn't even do that. And God won't allow you to do it either. Because we all have to reverence God's love, humbleness, meekness. And he will deliver us from all evil. If we just turn and love our brothers and sisters like we should love them. Like he does. Number 11 says, Then all his brothers and sisters and former friends came and feasted with him in, the home, in his home. And they uh, consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials that the Lord had brought against him. And each of them brought him a gift of money and a gold ring. He was blessed after that, and his, his friends and family came right back to him. And that's how you know you're being loved. It's when people don't hold nothing against you. But they come to console you and to comfort you. That's love. And then number 16 says, Job lived 140 years after that. Living, living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren. This is God. This is Job reverencing God. And he will deliver us from all evil. 17 says, then he died an old man who had lived a long, full life. So now we're going to Genesis 39, 6 through 12. And this is Joseph. We're talking about Joseph now. Joseph in Potiphar's house. Number six says, So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibilities over every thing he owed, owned. With, uh, with Joseph, he, with Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except the kind of food to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. This is just giving you a demonstration of who Joseph was. And why Potiphar's wife was after him. And when seven said that Potiphar's wife soon began to look and look at him lustfully. Come and see me. No, come and sleep with me. She demanded. She demanded it. She didn't just ask him. She demanded it. Because she felt like she was a uh, Potiphar's wife and she had the right to tell people what to do, regardless for, regardless if it was a sin or not. That's the mindset that she had. Number eight says, but Joseph refused. Look, he, he told her, my master trusted me with everything in his, in his entire household. And this is Joseph, how he reverenced God. And he was delivered from his evil just because he reverenced God. He loved God. He respected God. He honored God. This is why God delivered him. Number nine says, no one here has more authority than I do. He has held back 
nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against my God. Because Joseph reverenced God. And he, would, and he knew God would deliver him from evil. If he refused the evil that came before him. If he refused the temptation that came before him. And McKinnon says she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day. That's how the devil is. He worked on you day after day. Uh, but the re but he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her way as much as possible. Joseph reverenced God, deliverance. One, I mean, number 11 says, one day, however, no one else was around when he went in to, went in to do this work to do his work. Number 12 says, she came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on and sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left this cloak in her hand and he ran from the house. God will deliver you. He will deliver you if you keep your mind in the right place. Matthew 8, 5 through 10, the faith of the Roman officer. Number five says, when when Jesus turned to the, uh, when turned to Capernaum, and the Roman officer came and pleaded with him, the Lord, my, number six says, the Lord, my, no, Lord, my young servant lying in bed, paralyzed and in trouble, in terrible pain. Number seven says, Jesus said, I will come and heal him. Jesus had compassion even on the Roman soldier. That, that wasn't even a Jewish person, wasn't even an Israelite. Number eight says, but the officer said, Lord, I am not worried. I am not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. And this Roman soldier, not even knowing Christ, reverence his God. And God showed deliverance. Now when I said, I know this because I am under the authority of my uh, superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only uh, need to say, go, they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my servants, my slaves, do this, they do it. And when we, as people of God, children of God, can reverence God the way this soldier does, reverence his authority, his king, then we will be delivered from the evil one as well. Sickness struck his servant and he came to the Christ to get deliverance. M10 says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. True, no, no, turning to those who were followers of him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. That's saying something. That a Roman soldier had more faith than any other Israelite in Israel. That was a chosen people of God. That were children of God. Mm -mm. 
as he reverenced God, that he, as he reverenced Christ as God, he found deliverance for his servant. Number 13 says, Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, God, go back home because you believed. That's all you did was believe. It has happened. And this young servant was healed that same hour. As they was talking that same hour, Jesus healed his servant. Because all he did was believe. Isn't that amazing? That's all we got to do, y'all, is believe. And the conclusion to this lesson is this. Uh, ultimately, the meaning of deliver us from evil is not found in a decision of, uh, of the individual's words, but in the general description of the case. Satan is ultimately behind all evil is an opportunity is an opportunity to trust God or to uh, compromise and yield to sinful temptations and trust the same extent came under the control of sin and the evil. In the Lord's Prayer, we are instructed to pray that God will protect us from instructions that would tempt us to sin. It is a request that sin never gains a foothold in our lives. And that's the whole key. Do not let sin, allow sin to gain foothold in your life. Because God is your protector. He will protect you. He will provide for you. And my brothers and sisters, I thank you for listening to this lesson. I pray that you get a lot out of it. That God has opened up your understanding and up, opened up your eyes so that you can see what the Spirit of the Lord is trying to show you. God bless you. God loves you. And I love you too. Amen.